Chapter Seven of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Seven. Oliver Morley. In due time, the body of Daisy Kent was buried her remains were laid by those of her father in the very churchyard about which she had complained to giles a short time before the tragedy of her death ware being still ill did not attend the funeral but a large concourse of people from all parts of the country followed the coffin to the grave morley was a chief mourner and looked haggard as was natural poor mrs morley remained at home and wept she did little else but weep in those days poor soul when mr drake had finished the service and the grave was filled up the crowd dispersed there was a great deal of talk about the untimely death of the girl and the chances of her murderess being caught every one believed that anne was guilty but as steele had kept his own counsel and mrs perry held her tongue no mention was made of the tall man the chatter of sissy jinks and martha gibbs certainly seemed to inculpate him in the matter but only the villagers talked of this especial point it never reached the years of the reporters and did not get into the papers but the journals gave a good deal of space to the affair and hinted that it was what the french call un crime passionnel still no paper was daring enough to hint at giles and his presumed connection with the tragedy it was merely stated that he had been engaged to the deceased girl and felt her death so deeply as was natural that he had taken to his bed of course this was an embellishment of facts as ware was simply laid up with an attack of pneumonia but for the benefit of the public the journalist ascribed it to romantic and undying love giles who was a matter-of-fact young englishman did not see these descriptions or he would have been much disgusted at the sickly sentimentality meantime no news was heard of anne it was not known that the tall stranger had been with her for several people had seen the car passing on its way to tilbury it was a lucky thought that had made trim take that particular direction and merely by chance that he had stumbled on the motor overthrown in a hedge evidently an accident had occurred but no one was near at the time as it took place some little distance from tilbury and in a lonely part but it was conjectured that the two occupants had proceeded on foot to tilbury a boatman was found who related that he had taken a lady and gentleman across to gravesend and that the gentleman walked a trifle lame they landed on the gravesend shore and here the boatman lost sight of them it was the lady who paid his fare and he said that she appeared to be quite calm he did not see the face of the man but described that of anne and her dress also there was no doubt but what she was the fugitive however here the trail ended once in gravesend and all trace of the pair was lost steele made inquiries everywhere but without success the two might have got away in a ship but this he could not learn the night was foggy and dark and no ship had gone out of the river according to the boatman steele could discover nothing and resolved to throw up the case but at the eleventh hour he stumbled on a clue and followed it up the result of his inquiries made him return at once to rickwell where he sought out mr morley the little man had sent his wife and family away from the elms as the atmosphere of the house was melancholy in the extreme mrs morley not averse to more cheerful surroundings elected to go to brighton with the triplets and took two servants with her morley remained behind with a reduced staff and promised to join her later he desired to wait until he could see the detective his wish was speedily gratified for three days after the departure of his wife steele made his appearance morley received him in the library how do you do sir said the detective as they shook hands i am glad to see that you are looking better i am getting over the shock replied the other now that the poor child is buried there is no use mourning further i have sent my wife and family to brighton and propose to follow myself in a day or so i am lucky to have caught you then what have you found any clue i think so it is connected with the scarlet cross morley who was warming his hands over the fire looked round eagerly and his eyes flashed i thought there was something in that reference you remember the letter steele yes and i showed it to mrs perry 
to that meddlesome old woman why it's too long a matter to go into but it was just as well i did she gave me this little ornament morley turned over the enamelled cross and examined it carefully humph it is the kind of thing miss denham said was worn by her dead father exactly well mr morley either the father is dead as she told you and that cross was worn by a stranger or the man who called to see you here was the father how do you make that out what do you mean said morley and his face exhibited genuine amazement for answer steele related what mrs perry had told him about the discovery of the cross and how she had put two and two together and now sir you must see that in some way this stranger is connected with the crime he called to see you may i ask what you know of him absolutely nothing replied the other emphatically wait i must show you something he rose and went to his desk of course i am telling you my private business he added opening a drawer so don't please speak about it if it has nothing to do with the murder i won't but if Psha! that is all right i know as much about these things as you do however we can talk of that later meantime cast your eye over that and he placed a document on the table a judgment summons for five hundred pounds said steele with a whistle did he serve this yes replied morley returning to his seat with a gloomy face you will see that it is dated three days before he came to see me i have outrun the constable and have the greatest difficulty in keeping my head above water this man i don't know his name said that he came from those solicitors asher son and asher read out the detective morley nodded of twenty-two st audrey's inn a firm of sharpers i call them the money has certainly been owing a long time but i offered to pay off the sum by degrees they refused and insist upon immediate payment if they would only wait until the war is over my south african shares would go up and there would be a chance of settling the matter but they will not wait i expect a bankruptcy notice next i am very sorry for you mr morley and of course i shall not betray the confidence you have placed in me but the point is what is the name of the man who served this i don't know i never asked him his name he entered by the front door and served this here i sent him out by the window so that the servants should not see him again he had the look of a sheriff's officer and one can't be too careful here i believe mrs perry pays my servants to tell her what goes on in my house i didn't want her to learn about this summons i can easily understand that replied the detective and i see now why you let the man out by the window you left the room with him yes i didn't say anything much at the inquest beyond that he was a visitor and i was relieved when i found that no questions were asked but i walked with him to the end of the terrace and saw him go down the avenue then i returned to this room and found miss denham waiting by the desk i asked her what she wanted she asked for her wages as she was leaving the next day i had no ready money and promised to see to it before she departed then she went out and shortly afterwards miss kent came in to say she had seen the man go down the avenue she asked me who he was and i was rather short with her poor creature and morley sighed i wonder why the man went to church i can't say that but i can guess that when he knew who daisy was he wanted to speak to her what about asked steele eagerly about me and the summons you see steele there is a half uncle of daisy kent's who went to australia he said that if he made his fortune he would leave the money to her whether he is dead or alive i don't know but certainly she did not get any money left to her powell's solicitors are asher's son and asher powell i thought the uncle would be called kent unless of course he was uncle by the mother's side i said half uncle said morley dryly powell is his name william powell and his solicitors are those who issued that judgment summons i expect the clerk wanted to tell daisy about my position and warn her against lending me money as though i should have asked the girl for sixpence i don't see why this clerk should warn miss kent well you see daisy had a hundred a year and they pay it to her 
as she might one day be an heiress i suppose they think it as well to keep an eye on her this man could not have known that daisy was in church and may have just gone there to kill time but when he saw her and knew who she was i dare say he wrote that note asking her to come outside and be told all about me it might be so was the note found not to my knowledge but you should know being a detective i'm not omniscient replied steele good-humouredly it is only in novels that you get the perfect person who never makes a mistake well to resume i don't see why the clerk should have killed miss kent he did not kill her insisted morley i was in the room with him from the time he entered by the door to the time he left by that middle window he had no chance of stealing the stiletto now miss denham had for she was in the room alone for a few moments but why should she have taken the clerk with her on the car if she killed the girl her object must have been to escape herself i can't explain perhaps this clerk saw the crime and hoped to make money out of it had he given the alarm he wouldn't have gained any reward so i suppose he mounted the car with her so that she should not escape him a wild theory it's the only one i can think of responded morley but if you want to know more of this man go up to asher's son and asher i dare say they will be able to give you his history and the scarlet cross i know nothing about that i did not even notice if the man had such a cross on his chain in fact added morley frankly he was too shabby and poverty-stricken to have a chain i think ann denham killed daisy you think this man did and pardon protested steele i have not yet made up my mind but the two fled together and there must be some reason for that if so it will be found in the past history of both or either you know where to look for the man i can get from my wife the address of the governess's institute where she engaged miss denham that is all i can do unless i take up the case myself steele looked up with a laugh he was copying the address of the solicitors from the summons but could not help pausing to reply to this egotistical remark why mr morley what do you know of such work he asked bantering much more than you would give me credit for did you ever hear of by the way this is another of my secrets i am telling you so please don't repeat it are you going to say that you were in the profession i am you may have heard of joe bart i should think so said steele quickly he had a splendid reputation and was much thought of but he retired before i came to london i was in the country police for a long time but he started up you don't mean to say that that i am joe bart interrupted morley not ill-pleased yes i do i retired over ten years ago more fool i you see steele i grew wearied of thief-catching and as i had a chance of marrying a widow with money i took the offer and retired but he looked at the summons the game wasn't worth the candle i have had nothing but trouble still i am devoted to my wife and her children and you have forgotten your former glory said steele enthusiastically surely not that hatton garden jewel robbery the man with the red coat who committed the litchfield murder and i remember them all said morley with gentle melancholy i have a full report of all the cases i was engaged in yonder he nodded to a distant shelf sometimes i take those volumes down and think what an ass i was to retire but see here mr morley you are hard up you want money i am sure they would be glad to have you back at the yard why not recommence your detective life with searching out this case morley late joe bart shook his head there is no difficulty about this case to tempt me he said and denham killed the girl but i must say i should like to find out about this clerk and why he went off with her still it is useless for me to become a detective again in the first place my wife would not like it and in the second i have lost my keen scent i am rusty i am laid on the shelf no no steele you look after this matter yourself any advice i can give you i shall but don't tempt the old dog out of his kennel steele looked admiringly at his host 
bart had been a celebrated detective in his day although not one of the best still he had made a reputation on two or three cases which entitled him to respect i should be proud to work with you mr morley well well said morley rather pleased we'll see at present i must put my wits to work to get money to prevent my being made bankrupt now don't give me away Steele. i'll say nothing i suppose your wife knows that you were of course but she made me promise to give it up therefore you see i can't take up this life again but my advice to you if you care to take it is to look after the governess and leave the clerk alone she is guilty he is not i'll look after both said steele firmly after both mr bart morley laughed report to me all you do he said and this steele willingly promised End of chapter seven read by celine major chapter eight of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Eight The Irony of Fate. Giles was slowly recovering from his illness, but as yet was unable to leave his room. It was now over a month since the death of Daisy, and during that time all matters connected therewith had been reported to the invalid thus he knew of the funeral of the verdict of the jury and of the search that was being made for anne trim who nursed his young master and he would not allow any one else to do so day by day related all that was taking place the man himself quite believed that miss denham was guilty but he did not offer this opinion to ware knowing how keenly giles felt the untoward tragedy the young squire could not bring himself to believe that anne was guilty appearances were against her and he could not conceive what excuse she could make for her flight with the lawyer's clerk if she were innocent she had gone the best way to work up a feasible case against her but giles was so deeply in love with her that the blacker became her character in the mouths of the general public the more persistently he held to the belief that it was whiter than snow had he been able he would have followed her in order to persuade her to return and face the worst with a frank story of the events of that terrible night but he was chained to his bed and even had he been sufficiently well he could not have traced her whereabouts steele had called to explain his doings but not even he could guess where anne was to be found and giles rejoiced that this should be so what's the news this morning trim he asked languidly mr morley has come to see you sir he is waiting below i thought he had gone to brighton with his wife and family he did go some days back assented trim but he returned sir so he says especially to see you how very good of him ask him to come up are you strong enough master giles yes you old tyrant i hope to be up and about in a week trim shook his grey head he was rather a pessimist and did not believe in two sudden recoveries insisting that such did not last you'll have a relapse sir and be worse than ever ware laughed knowing trim's ways and motioned him out of the room when the old servant left grumbling that his master should be disturbed giles began to wonder what had brought morley back from brighton perhaps he had come to speak of daisy and her untimely end but he had already on a previous occasion said all that was to be said about that matter ware sincerely mourned daisy for in a way he had been fond of her still he could not but confess that a marriage between them would have been a mistake and that drastic as was the cutting of the gordian knot it relieved him from an impossible position his love for anne would always have stood between himself and the unfortunate girl and her jealousy would have ruined both their lives certainly he saw no chance of making anne his wife seeing that she was a fugitive and accused of a terrible crime nevertheless since he had not to marry daisy the situation was less difficult but where his heart aching for the woman he loved found cold comfort in this reasoning morley entered looking ruddy and cheerful quite his old self in fact 
evidently the sea air and the change had assuaged his grief to a considerable extent and giles could not help remarking cynically on his quick recovery i thought you were fond of daisy he said reproachfully i was and so was my wife answered morley taking a seat beside the bed but what's done can't be undone and i have been trying to get over my sorrow but in spite of my looks where i have my bad moments and you i sincerely mourn for the poor girl it is terrible that she should be cut off so suddenly but i am just as sorry for miss denham if not more sorry it is those who are left behind that suffer most morley hm said the little man thoughtfully then you did love miss denham morley giles started up on his elbow what do you mean i am simply repeating what daisy said she had a monomania on the subject said ware uneasily i never gave her any cause for jealousy would you have married her had she lived certainly said ware coldly i promised my father that the daughter of his old friend should be my wife i am sure you would have acted honourably said morley gravely but it is just as well that you did not marry the girl i think she had some reason to be jealous of miss denham ware groaned i tried my best to he broke off with a frown this is my private business morley you have no right to pry into these things morley shrugged his shoulders as you please i shall say no more but i don't expect you'll see miss denham again i don't expect i shall please leave her name out of this conversation for the moment i am agreeable to do so but as i believe her to be guilty i must ask you a question or two i shall answer no questions responded giles violently miss denham is innocent then why did she fly i don't know if i can only find her i shall ask her to come back and face the worst she can explain she will have to when she is caught how do you propose to find her where i don't know wait till i am on my feet again well said morley cheerfully i'll give you a clue the scarlet cross rubbish there is nothing in that in spite of the anonymous letter what do you know about the matter only what steele told me he found a boatman at gravesend who declared that on the day of the crime steele gave him the date a small steam yacht was lying in the river off the town it was called the red cross the next morning it was gone the night was foggy and no one saw it leave its moorings it simply vanished what do you make of that ware nothing at all what has this yacht to do with miss denham can't you see the anonymous letter referred to a scarlet cross such an ornament was picked up in the church and the boat was called the red cross not the scarlet cross interrupted ware only a difference of shade said morley ironically but i am certain that miss denham with her companion went on board that yacht i can't think how else they escaped why should this lawyer's clerk have gone on board that's what steele is trying to find out i expect he will make inquiries of asher son and asher's office but the name of the yacht the fact that miss denham made for gravesend where it was lying and its appearance and disappearance within twenty-four hours during which the crime was committed shows me that she fled and that she is guilty ware restrained himself with a violent effort oh he said ironically then you believe that miss denham arranged that the yacht should be at gravesend ready for her flight after the death of daisy it looks like that assented morley i believe myself that the crime was premeditated and was the fact of my car being at the church gate premeditated asked ware angrily why not miss denham knew that your car was coming for you after the service morley i admit that things look black but she is not guilty humph you love her that has nothing to do with it as you will let us say no more on the subject i wish to tell you why i came it is sure to be a more disagreeable subject retorted giles then felt compunction for the rude speech i beg your pardon morley i am a perfect bear 
but this illness has made me peevish and the events of the last few weeks have rendered my brain irritable forgive my bad temper oh that's all right ware replied his visitor heartily i can always make allowances for invalids you'll be your old self again shortly i shall never be myself again replied giles gloomily it was on the tip of morley's tongue to make some fresh reference to anne but he knew that such a remark would only exasperate the invalid and moreover giles looked so ill and worried that morley generously refrained from adding to his troubles let us come to business he said taking some papers out of his breast-coat pocket since you were engaged to daisy i thought it right that you should be made aware of a communication i have received from asher son and asher about the summons you told me of asked ware wearily he did not take much interest in morley's affairs no i have managed to compromise that the solicitors have accepted payment in instalments in this instance they write to me officially as daisy's guardian she has come into five thousand a year ware giles opened his eyes and sat up in bed excitedly do you mean to say that her half-uncle powell is dead morley nodded very ironical isn't it he said she was always talking and hoping for the money and now when it comes she is unable to enjoy it what tricks fate plays us to be sure poor girl sighed giles how often have we discussed the prospect of her being an heiress i always told her that i had enough for both but she hankered after having money in her own right look at the papers said morley handing them to the young man and you will see that powell died over four months ago in sydney his solicitors arranged about the estate in the colony of new south wales and then communicated with asher as powell had advised them before he died there is a copy of the will there so i see but tell me the chief points in it i feel too tired to wade through all this legal matter well the money was left to daisy and failing her it goes to a man called george franklin hm he has come in for his kingdom very speedily thanks to the death of poor daisy who is he morley glanced at a letter he was the brother-in-law of mr powell married powell's sister who is dead i don't know if there is any family asher's firm doesn't know the whereabouts of franklin but they are advertising for him the five thousand a year goes to him without reservation why did they tell you all this i really can't say unless it is because i was daisy's legal guardian i wish she had come in for this money where for i do not say but what i shouldn't have been glad of a trifle and if daisy had lived she would have paid me something certainly as i did what i did do out of sheer friendship with her father i have no right to demand anything but when franklin hears of my circumstances i hope he will lend me some money to get me out of my difficulties it all depends upon the kind of man he turns out to be but i always thought morley that it was your wife to whom kent left his daughter she was an old friend of his quite so but kent appointed me guardian as mrs morley refused to be legally bound i am sure i did my duty added the little man with sudden heat i am sure you did you behaved like a father to her and i am sorry she did not live to repay you giles thought for a moment or so then added i was engaged to daisy and i am rich let me help you morley no thanks it is good of you to suggest such a thing but i am a very independent man if this franklin will do anything i don't mind accepting a thousand from him otherwise no where giles admired the bluff way in which morley said this he knew well that for a long time morley and his wife had done all they could for daisy kent and that both of them deserved great praise he suggested that mrs morley might be induced no interrupted his visitor my wife wants nothing she has her own money and ample means then why don't you ask her for her help my dear ware i married mrs morley because i loved her and not for her money all her property is settled on herself and i have not touched one shilling of it she would willingly help me but i have refused isn't that rather quixotic on your part perhaps responded morley with some dryness but it is my nature 
however i see that i am tiring you i only came to tell you of this irony of fate whereby daisy inherited a fortune too late to benefit by it i must go now my wife expects me back in brighton to-morrow when do you return to the elms in a month and what are your movements ware thought for a few minutes before he answered at length he spoke seriously morley i know you are prejudiced against miss denham i think she is guilty if that is what you mean ware and i say that she is innocent i intend to devote myself to finding her and to clearing up this mystery well i wish you good luck said morley moving towards the door but don't tell me when you find miss denham if i come across her i'll have her arrested that's plain enough well since you are her declared enemy i shall keep my own counsel he raised himself on his elbow but i tell you morley that i shall find her i shall prove her innocence and i shall make her my wife morley opened the door the age of miracles is past he said when you are more yourself you will be wiser good-bye and a speedy recovery as the visitor departed trim entered with the letters he was not at all pleased to find giles so flushed and refused to hand over the correspondence only when ware began to grow seriously angry did trim give way he went grumbling out of the room as giles opened his letters the first two were from his friends in town asking after his health the third had a french stamp and the paris postmark ware opened it listlessly he then uttered an exclamation on a sheet of thin foreign paper was the drawing in pencil of a half-sovereign of edward the seventh and thereon three circles placed in a triangle marked respectively a d and p below in a handwriting he knew only too well was written the one word innocent anne anne cried ware passionately kissing the letter as though i needed you to tell me that and it was not till an hour later that he suddenly remembered what a narrow escape he had had from putting morley on the track of anne denham had morley seen that letter paris murmured giles i'll go there end of chapter eight read by celine major Chapter Nine of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh, Chapter Nine. A strange discovery. The offices of Asher, Son, and Asher were situated in a dark, narrow street in the city, which led down to the river in former days the place might have been respectable and then the original asher had set up his official tent in the neighbourhood but civilization had moved westward and terry street was looked on askance by fashionable solicitors nevertheless the firm of asher continued to dwell in the dingy office where their progenitors had slaved for close on a hundred years it was quite good enough thought the present head of the firm for such well-known lawyers the firm did a good old-fashioned business eminently respectable and safe none of the three partners was a sharper as morley asserted but as the firm had issued a judgment summons against the master of the elms he could scarcely be expected to think well of them old mr asher rarely came to the office preferring his country house and melon beds and the business was conducted by the son and the other asher who was a cousin both these gentlemen were over forty and in spite of a modern education were decidedly old-fashioned there was something in the musty air of the terry street office that petrified them into old men before their due time the three clerks who sat in the outer rooms were also elderly and the sole youthful creature about the place was the office boy a red-haired imp who answered to the name of alexander his surname was benker but was not thought sufficiently dignified for use in so sedate a place of business with some difficulty steele found this musty haunt of the legal muse and sent up his name to the senior partner with a request for an interview alexander whistling between his teeth led him into a frowsy apartment lined with books and tin boxes 
and furnished with a green baize covered table heaped with legal papers three chairs and a mahogany sofa of the early victorian period mr asher the son might have belonged to the same epoch in spite of his age so rusty and smug did he look his face was clean-shaven with the exception of side whiskers his hair was thin on the top and sparse on the sides and he was dressed in a suit of solemn black with a satin tie to match in fact he was the typical lawyer of melodrama and steele was surprised to find so ancient a survival in these modern days but when they began to talk asher proved to be quite able to hold his own and was not at all fossilized in brain whatever he might be in appearance he knew not only the name of steele but all about the case and steele's connection therewith he referred in feeling terms to daisy's death a very charming girl mr steele said the young old lawyer on several occasions she has been here to draw her little income it is sad that she should have met with her death at the hands of a jealous woman at the very time she was about to enjoy a legacy of five thousand a year you don't say so cried steele who had heard nothing of this ah uh, mr morley never informed you of the fact well no he didn't but then i have not seen him for over a week i believe he is at brighton with his wife who left this money to the late miss kent a relative of hers who died lately in australia and failing her who inherits mr asher reflected i don't know that you have any right to ask that question he said after a pause pardon me replied the detective miss kent was murdered i fancied that the money might have something to do with the commission of the crime no mr steele i read the evidence given at the inquest jealousy was the motive of the crime and miss denham is guilty i am somewhat of that way of thinking myself mr asher and on the face of it there is no other way of accounting for the murder nevertheless it is just as well to look at the matter from all sides the crime may be connected with the question of this fortune you may as well tell me what i wish to know i'll keep my mouth closed are you going to accuse our client of the crime asked asher dryly i fear you will waste your time if you do since you look at the matter in this way i don't mind speaking about what after all is not your business that is as it may be returned steele enigmatically asher passed this remark over failing miss kent the five thousand a year goes to george franklin a brother-in-law of the testator we lately received a letter from him informing us that he intended to claim the money how did he know that he would inherit we advertised for him he is quite unaware of the death of miss kent and i dare say thinks mr powell left the fortune to him direct you can't be certain of his ignorance however let us give him the benefit of the doubt where did he write from from florence in italy where he has lived for four years he will be in london next week and if you want to see him i'll think of it interrupted steele there may be no need to trouble mr franklin at present i am searching for this clerk of yours who went off with miss denham the lawyer raised his eyebrows with manifest surprise a clerk of ours mr steele i don't quite follow you i refer to the man who served a judgment summons on mr morley a boy served that explained asher the boy who showed you in steele stared hard at the solicitor trying to understand why he had made such a statement but that is absurd he remarked i know that nothing was said at the inquest about the matter as mr morley did not wish it to be known that he was in such difficulties but a tall man with a reddish beard dressed in a greatcoat with a white scarf served the summons afterwards he went to the midnight service in the paris church and lured miss kent outside by means of a note which we cannot find from what i have gathered this man went with miss denham in mr ware's motor-car he fled with her and i fancy he must be either the assassin or an accessory after the fact asher heard all this with extreme surprise when steele concluded he touched the bell alexander responded with his usual cheerful and impudent air his master addressed him with some severity what about that summons which was served by you on mr morley of rickwell he demanded the lad grew crimson to his ears and looked at the floor much embarrassed 
i served it all right sir he mumbled you served it struck in steel with emphasis that is quite untrue a tall man with a red beard served it alexander tell the truth what does this mean the boy began to sob and drew his coat-sleeve across his eye with a snuffle i thought it was all right he said or i should not have given it to him the summons you gave it to someone to serve yes sir to mr wilson mother's lodger is he tall has he a pale face and a red beard asked steele he has sir he's been with mother six months and was always kind when i got the summons he said that he was going into the country and would serve it on mr morley alexander said asher in an awful tone i gave you money for your railway fare to go to rickwell what have you done with that money wretched boy i went to the hippodrome with another boy wept alexander i thought as i'd take the holiday as you'd think i was in the country please sir i'm very sorry but i thought mr wilson was all right did mr wilson come back to say that all was right demanded steele sharply no sir he didn't mother and i ain't set eyes on him since he went away to serve the summons i was afraid to tell you sir he added to his master cause i knew i'd done wrong but i hope you won't be hard on me sir alexander said mr asher you have disgraced a most respectable office and can no longer continue in it you have spent money you have wasted time both given to you for a certain purpose for the sake of your mother who is a hard-working woman i shall not take any legal steps but from this day you cease to be in our employment your wages for the week shall be confiscated since you have made free with my money at five to-day alexander you leave this place for ever oh sir please sir i didn't alexander i have spoken you can depart with a howl the boy went out of the room and sat weeping in the outer office for at least ten minutes he was wondering what he should say to his mother for she was a terrible woman with a short temper and a hard hand his fellow clerks demanded what was the matter but alexander had sense enough to keep his own counsel all he said was that the governor had discharged him and then he wept afresh while thus employed steele made his appearance he had been discussing the matter with asher and had proposed a course of action in connection with the delinquent to which asher agreed he advanced to the weeping alexander and lifted him from his seat by the collar come young man said he take me home to your mother at once oh lor cried alexander she'll give me beans you deserve the worst beating she can give you said steele severely while the clerks grinned however you must come with me where do you live warder street lambeth snuffled alexander and urged by the hand on his collar went out of the office with the detective we'll take a hansom said steele and shortly was his constant one with the miserable alexander as a rule a ride in a hansom would have been a joy to master benker but he was too much afraid of the meeting with his mother to take any pleasure in the treat however he relied on the promise of the detective that he would soothe the maternal ire and managed to reply fairly well to the questions steele asked these referred to mr wilson who is he demanded the detective mother's lodger replied alexander he's been with her six months and mother thought a deal of him he was kind to me ah was he well off i don't know he paid his rent regular but he wore shabby clothes and was always out i only saw him at night when i came home from the office did he ask you many questions about the office oh yes he said he wished me to get on that i was a smart boy and a credit to my mother so you are answered steele genially i'm sure she'll give you a proof of her approval to-day now don't cry boy steele shook alexander and then demanded suddenly you copy all the letters do you not yes i do answered master benker wondering why this was asked and you read them sometimes nearly always i like to know what's going on mr wilson said i should make myself acquainted with everything 
i'm sure he did muttered steele ironically did you read any letter saying that miss kent had inherited a fortune miss daisy kent who lived with mr morley at rickwell alexander thought for a moment yes i did it was a letter to some lawyers in sydney did you tell mr wilson about it yes sir he was always talking about people coming in for money and i said that a girl called miss kent had come in for five thousand a year i thought so when did you tell mr wilson this three days after christmas before he offered to serve the summons why i hadn't got the summons then said alexander mr asher gave it to me the day before new year i said i was going into the country to rickwell for mr wilson asked me what i was making myself smart for he said he'd take the summons and that i could go to the hippodrome with jim tyler which you did on your employer's money you are a smart lad alexander what did your mother say mother was out when i came home with the summons and after mr wilson said he'd take it i didn't say anything to her then she thought that on the day before the new year you were at the office as usual yes snuffled master benker she did oh lor as the cab stopped before a tidy house in a quiet street here we are and there is your mother said the detective cheerfully as a severe face appeared at the white curtained window alexander wept afresh as steel paid the cabman and positively howled when the door opened and his mother a lean woman in a black dress with the widow's cap appeared he would have run away but that steel again had a hand on his collar alexander cried his mother harshly what have you been doing nothing very dreadful ma'am interposed steel it will be all right let me in and i'll speak for my young friend and who may you be sir demanded mrs benker bristling a personal friend of mr asher's on hearing this dreaded name mrs benker softened and welcomed steele into a neat parlour where he seated himself in a horsehair mahogany chair of the most slippery description and related what had happened alexander stood by and wept all the time he wept more when his mother spoke i expected it she said in a quiet despair that boy is the bane of my life i'll speak to you shortly alexander go to your room and retire to bed oh mother mother cried master benker writhing at the prospect of a thorough whipping go to your room alexander and make ready repeated the widow with a glare and the boy retired slowly wriggling and snuffling when his sobs died away and an upstairs door was heard to close with a bang mrs benker addressed herself to steele i hope you will induce mr asher to overlook this she said clasping a pair of lean mittened hands i am so poor i'll do my best responded steele that is if you will give me some information about your late lodger mr wilson why should i do that asked mrs benker suspiciously because mr asher wishes to know all about him you see your son allowed mr wilson to serve this summons and it is necessary that mr asher should learn where he is that's only fair but i don't know mr wilson has not returned here since he left on the day before new year did he leave any luggage behind him no sir he didn't mrs benker paused then continued i'll tell you exactly how it occurred if mr asher will make some allowance for the wickedness of that wretched boy of mine i'll see what can be done and use my influence with mr asher thank you sir said the widow gratefully well sir i was absent all the last day of the year as i was seeing a married daughter of mine in marylebone mr wilson was in the house when i left at ten in the morning but said nothing about going away when i returned at six in the evening i found that he was gone bag and baggage and that he had left his rent on the table also a note saying that he was suddenly called away and would not return have you the note asked steele thinking it just as well to have some specimen of wilson's handwriting mrs benker shook her head i burnt it she replied it was only written in pencil and not worth keeping 
i must say that mr wilson always behaved like a gentleman although i saw little of him he was queer in his habits how do you mean queer well sir i hardly ever saw him in the daytime and when i did he usually kept his blinds down in his room as he suffered from weak eyes even when he saw alexander in the evening he would hardly have any light then sometimes he would lie in bed all the day and be out all the night at other times he would stay at home the whole of the twenty-four hours but he always paid his rent regularly and gave little trouble over his food yes added mrs benker smoothing her apron mr wilson was always a gentleman i will say that hum thought steele taking all this in eagerly a queer kind of gentleman he added aloud did you know anything else about him mrs benker no sir she drew herself up primly i never pry never did any one call to see mr wilson no one all the time he was here not one person called did he receive any letters no not one letter arrived queer murmured steele what newspaper did he take the morning post also he took the world truth modern society and m a p he was fond of the fashionable intelligence oh he was was he would you have called him a gentleman he always paid his rent duly hesitated mrs benker so far he was a perfect gentleman but i have lived as a lady's maid in the best family sir and i don't think mr wilson was what you or i would call an aristocrat i see so you were a lady's maid once in what families mrs benker was not at all averse to relating her better days and did so with pride i was with the countess of flint with mrs harwich and with lady susan somersdale ah said steele starting he remembered that morley had been concerned with lady somersdale about the robbery of her jewels did you tell mr wilson this he asked oh yes we had long talks about aristocratic families she repeated several tales she had told wilson and steele asked her many questions when he took his leave he asked a leading one did mr wilson wear a red cross as an ornament on his watch-chain he did said mrs benker and steele departed very satisfied with his day's work End of chapter nine read by celine major chapter ten of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Ten, On a Fresh Trail. If Giles Ware had not been desperately in love and desperately anxious to find Anne Denham, he would scarcely have gone to Paris on such a wild goose chase. The postmark on the letter showed that she was, or she had been, in the French capital but to find her in that immense city was like looking for a haystack in a league-long desert however ware had an idea foolish enough that some instinct would guide him to her side and therefore as soon as he recovered sufficiently to travel he crossed the channel with trim he left rickwell about three weeks after his interview with morley time enough as he well knew for anne to change her place of residence but he trusted to luck for quite a fortnight he explored the city accompanied by the faithful old servant trim had sharp eyes and would be certain to recognize anne if she came within eyesight but in spite of their vigilance and observation the two saw no one even distantly resembling anne certainly if giles had gone to the authorities who take note of all who come and go he might have been more successful but knowing that anne was wanted by the english police he did not dare to adopt this method he was forced to rely entirely on himself and his search resulted in nothing it ain't no good master giles said trim for at least the tenth time we've lost the scent somehow better go back to london i don't want you to be ill over here sir with nothing but foreign doctors to look after you 
i shan't leave paris until i am certain that she is not in the place declared ware resolutely well sir i don't know how much more certain you wants to be we've tramped them boulevards and shammy elizas till our feet are near dropping off you're looking a shadow master giles if you'll excuse an old man as nursed you when you were a baby she ain't here now i shouldn't be surprised if she were in london said trim wisely what in the very jaws of the lion nonsense oh but is it sir i always heard it said by them as knows that the jaws of the lion is the very last place any one expects to find them trim did not state what them he meant if she went back to rickwell she would be safe especially if she laid up in some cottage and called herself a widder trim you've been reading detective novels not me sir i ain't got no time but about this going back we'll go back to-morrow trim said ware with sudden resolution and trim joyfully departed to pack it just struck giles that after all trim might be right and that having thrown the police off the scent by going abroad in the yacht anne might return to london she might be there now living in some quiet suburb while the police were wasting their time corresponding with the french authorities moreover ware thought it would be just as well to learn what steele was doing he had charge of the case and might have struck the trail in that case giles wanted to know for he could then avert any possible danger from anne and finally he reflected that he might learn something about anne's friends from the people at the governess's institute where mrs morley had engaged her if she returned to london it was not impossible that she might have gone to hide in the house of some friend any one who knew anne could be certain that she was not guilty of the crime she was accused of and would assuredly aid her to escape the unjust law so thought giles in his ardour but he quite forgot that every one was not in love with anne and would scarcely help her unless they were fully convinced of her innocence and perhaps not even then most people have a holy horror of the law and are not anxious to help those in danger of the long arm of justice however giles reasoned as above and forthwith left paris for london he took up his quarters in the guelph hotel opposite the park and began his search for anne again luckily he had obtained from mrs morley the number of the institute which was in south kensington and the day after his arrival walked there to make inquiries it was a very forlorn hope but ware saw no other chance of achieving his desire the institute was a tall red brick house with green blinds and a prim tidy look he was shown into a prim parlour and interviewed by a prim old lady who wore spectacles and had a pencil stuffed in the bosom of her black gown however she was less prim than she looked and had a cheerful old ruddy face with a twinkling pair of kindly eyes in her heart mrs cairns admired this handsome young man who spoke so politely and was more willing to afford him the desired information than if he had been elderly and ugly old as she was the good lady was a true daughter of eve and her natural liking for the opposite sex had not been crushed out of her by years of education nevertheless when she heard the name of anne she threw up her hands in dismay why do you come here to ask about that unfortunate girl she demanded and looked severely at giles before he could reply she glanced again at his card which she held in her fingers and started giles where she read drawing a quick breath are you i was engaged to the young lady who was killed said ware surprised mrs cairns rosy face became a deep red and you doubtless wish to avenge her death by finding miss denham on the contrary i wish to save miss denham what do you not believe her guilty no mrs cairns i do not every one says she killed the girl but i am certain that she is an innocent woman i come to ask you if you can tell me where she is why do you come to me mrs cairns went to see that the door was closed before she asked this question i thought you might know of her whereabouts why should i well i admit that there is no reason why you should at least i thought so before i came here and now she bent forward eagerly 
now i think that if she had come to you for refuge she would get help from you i can see that you also believe her guiltless i do said mrs cairns in a low voice i have known anne for years and i am certain that she is not the woman to do a thing like this she would not harm a fly then you can help me you know where she is mrs cairns looked at his flushed face at the light in his eyes in her shrewd way she guessed the secret of this eagerness then you love her she said under her breath you love anne why do you say that asked giles taken aback he was not prepared to find that she could read him so easily i remember said mrs cairns to herself but loud enough for him to hear there was a society paper said something about jealousy being the motive of the crime and do you mean to say that such a statement was in the papers asked ware angrily and with a flash of his blue eyes it was in none of the big daily papers mr ware they offered no explanation but some society reporter went down to rickwell to gather scandal from the servants i suppose off from mrs barry muttered giles then aloud yes well this man or woman most probably it was a woman made up a very pretty tale which was printed in the firefly a scandalous paper said ware annoyed what did it say that you were in love with anne that you were engaged to miss kent and that to gain you as her husband anne killed the girl it's a foul lie i'll horsewhip the editor and make him put in an apology i shouldn't do that if i were you mr ware said the old lady dryly better let sleeping dogs lie i don't believe the whole story myself only part of it what part mrs cairns that part which says you love anne i can see it in your face if i can trust you certainly you can anne is like my own child i believe her guiltless of this terrible crime and i would do anything to see her righted she did not kill the girl no i believe the girl was killed by a nameless man who came to rickwell from some firm of solicitors i don't know why he murdered the poor child no more than i can understand why anne should have helped him to escape you call her anne said mrs cairns softly giles flushed through the tan of his strong face i have no right to do so he said she never gave me permission mrs cairns i assure you that there was no understanding between miss denham and myself i was engaged by my father to miss kent and we were to be married i fell in love with miss denham and i have reason to believe that she returned my love she told you so no no she and i never said words like that to one another we were friends nothing more miss kent chose to be jealous of a trifling gift i gave miss denham at christmas and there was trouble then came an anonymous letter saying that anne wished to kill daisy a letter and said that exclaimed mrs cairns in surprise but i can't understand it at all anne had no enemies so far as i know no one could hate so sweet a girl her father did you know her father asked ware quickly no but she often spoke of him she was fond of her father although he seems to have been a wandering bohemian he died at florence i wonder if he really did die of course he but it's a long story mr ware and i have not the time to tell it to you besides there is one who can tell you all about anne and her father much better than i can the princess caraxe do you know her i have seen the name somewhere probably on a programme said mrs cairns composedly oh don't look so astonished the princess is really a hungarian aristocrat she quarrelled with her people and came to england with very little money to keep herself alive she tried to become a governess afterwards having a beautiful voice she became a concert singer i hear she is very popular how should she know about anne i mean miss denham 
because if there is any woman to whom anne would go in her distress it would be the princess she met anne here while she was a governess and the two became great friends they were always together i do not know where anne is mr ware she did not come to me nor has she written but if she is in england the princess will know do you think she would tell me asked giles eagerly i really don't know she is romantic and if she learned that you loved anne she might be inclined to help you but that would depend upon anne herself how is she disposed towards you for answer giles related the episode of the foreign letter with the drawing of the coin and the one word innocent mrs cairns listened quietly and nodded evidently anne values your good opinion i think you had better tell all this to the princess she hastily wrote a few lines this is her address oh thank you thank you and mr ware added the old lady laying a kind hand on his arm if you hear about anne come and tell me i hope with all my soul that you will be able to save the poor child if human aid can prove her innocence you can depend upon me was ware's reply and taking leave of mrs cairns he left the institute with his heart beating and his head in the air giles was glad that his good fortune had led him to meet this true friend of the woman he loved he was also glad that he had been so open with her about his passion else she might not have sent him to the princess Caraxay. as the name came into his mind he glanced down at the paper which he still held the address of anne's friend was forty two gilbert mansions westminster giles resolved to lose no time in looking her up she would be able to tell him where anne was and also might be able to explain the mystery of anne's life in general and her conduct at rickwell in particular for there was some mystery about miss denham ware was quite certain on that point she had said that her father was dead and circumstances pointed to the fact that her father was alive and was the nameless man who had appeared and disappeared so suddenly then there was the strange episode of the anonymous letter and the queer reference therein to the scarlet cross also the fact that the yacht in which anne had fled was called the red cross all these things hinted at a mystery and such might in some indirect way be connected with the death of daisy kent anne had not killed her but since she had aided the murderer to escape she must have condoned the crime in some way ware shuddered as he looked at the matter in this light what if anne knew something about the matter after all the next moment he put the thought from him with anger anne was good and pure and her hands were clean from the stain of blood such a woman would not could not commit a crime either directly or indirectly when he saw her he would ask for an explanation and once she opened her mouth all would be made plain arguing thus with himself giles wrote a letter to the princess Caraxay and asked for an interview he mentioned that he had seen mrs cairns and that the old lady had furnished him with the address also he said that his wish in seeing the princess was to ask for the whereabouts of miss denham having dispatched this note giles felt that he could do no more until he received a reply but he was too restless to remain quiet it occurred to him that he might look up steel and learn what fresh discoveries had been made in connection with the rickwell crime he went to new scotland yard and asked for the detective but learned to his surprise and vexation that the man was out of town and was not expected back for a week no one could say where he had gone so giles had to satisfy himself with leaving a card and promising to call again the next day he received a note from the princess Caraxay asking him to come the next evening at nine o'clock she said nothing about anne nor did she volunteer any information she simply appointed an hour and a place for the interview and signed herself olga Caraxay. giles felt that she had been intentionally curt and wondered if she intended to give him a civil reception after some thought he decided that she meant to be kind although the note read so coldly he would go and perhaps during the interview she might be persuaded to help him after all she must know that he had been engaged to marry the dead girl and fancied as mrs cairns had done that he wished to have anne arrested 
the following evening he arrayed himself with particular care and drove in a hansom to westminster the cab stopped before a great pile of brick buildings near the abbey and when giles had dismissed it he entered a large and well-lighted hall with a tessellated pavement here a porter volunteered on ascertaining his business to conduct him to the door of the princess caraxes flat which was on the first floor giles was admitted by a neat maid-servant who showed him into a picturesque drawing-room a tall woman in evening dress was standing beside the window in the twilight giles thought her figure was familiar and recognized the turn of her head he uttered a cry anne he said stretching his arms anne my dearest End of chapter ten read by celine major chapter eleven of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter eleven princess caraxe even as he spoke the room was flooded with the light of the electric lamps the woman by the window turned and came forward smiling with a feeling of bitter disappointment giles recoiled it was not anne he had been deceived by a chance resemblance i can quite understand your mistake said the princess caraxe it is not the first time that i have been taken for my friend indeed she was very like anne both in figure and face she had the same dark hair and dark eyes the same oval face and rich colouring but her expression was different she was more haughty than miss denham and there was less simplicity in her manner even as ware looked at her the likeness seemed to vanish and he wondered that he should have made such a mistake but for the twilight the turn of her head and her height together with the way in which she carried herself he would not have been deceived one would take you for miss denham's sister he said when seated the princess smiled oddly we are alike in many ways she replied quietly i look upon miss denham as my second self you called me anne when you mistook me for her she added with a keen glance i have no right to do so princess but he hesitated not knowing how to choose his words she saw his perplexity and smiled i quite understand mr ware anne i mean miss denham has told you about me i have not seen her for months mr ware not since that terrible event which has made a fugitive of her giles was bitterly disappointed and his face showed his feelings from what mrs cairns had said he was certain that the princess would be able to help him and here she confessed an ignorance of anne's whereabouts nevertheless ware still hoped he thought that not knowing his real errand she was feigning ignorance for the sake of her friend's safety i am sorry she has not spoken to you about me he remarked for then you would know that i wish her well oh i know that anne i may as well call her anne to you mr ware wrote to me from rickwell several times she told me all about you but i have not seen her since the death of your fiancee i have no idea where she is now i thought and mrs cairns thought that she would come to you in her distress or at least communicate her whereabouts she has done neither and i do not know where to address a letter what is to be done said giles half to himself and much distressed princess caraxe rose and glanced at the clock with a laugh oh if we talk something may come of our putting our heads together she said meantime we can make ourselves comfortable here are coffee and cigarettes mr ware would you prefer a cigar no thank you princess these look very good both coffee and cigarettes are turkish said she handing him a cup and afterwards a cigarette i get them from a cousin of mine who is an attache at constantinople come now she lighted a cigarette for herself and sat down on an amber divan near ware's chair let us talk before my friend arrives i beg your pardon princess i hope my coming no no she explained hurriedly i asked my friend to meet you indeed giles was much surprised i did not know we had a mutual friend 
the princess nodded and blew a cloud of smoke at ten o'clock you shall see him i won't tell you who he is a little surprise mr ware ware looked at her sharply but could make nothing of the enigmatic smile on her face she was undeniably a very beautiful woman as she lounged amongst the amber-tinted cushions but in her dress and general looks there was something barbaric she wore a dinner-dress of mingled scarlet and black and many chains of sequins which jingled with her every movement as ware's eyes met her own she flashed a languorous look at him and a slow smile wreathed her full red lips giles could not help admiring her but he had a feeling that she was not altogether to be trusted it behoved him to be wary in dealing with this superb tigress yet as another thought crossed his mind he smiled involuntarily why do you smile mr ware asked the princess she spoke the english language admirably and with but a little foreign accent pardon replied giles still smiling but mrs cairns told me that at one time you aspired to become a governess i can't imagine you teaching children ah you have no imagination no englishman has children are fond of me very fond she cast another look at his handsome face and added with emphasis i can make any one i choose fond of me i quite believe it princess you have a woman's imperial sceptre beauty a charming compliment responded she her mood changing but we are not here to exchange compliments so you love anne with all my heart and soul he replied fervently his hostess appeared rather disconcerted by this reply you are a miracle of chivalry my dear mr ware she said dryly but is it not rather a large heart you have to love two women at the same time i understand what you mean answered ware quietly but my engagement to miss kent was purely a family arrangement i loved anne i still love her all the same i would have married miss kent had she not been murdered you are very obedient mr ware and you very satirical princess i could explain but there is no need for me to do so i want to find anne can you help me not at present but i may be able to do so of course you don't believe that she killed your fiance certainly not i think the crime was committed by the man with whom she fled a tall man with a red beard and hair and black eyes yes yes do you know him who is he i have had him described to me responded the princess calmly but i know nothing about him is he a friend of anne's that i don't know she quietly selected another cigarette lighted it and looked with a serene smile at her visitor giles was annoyed we don't seem to be getting on with our business princess he said roughly what is our business she demanded looking at him through half-closed eyes her scrutiny made giles uncomfortable and he shifted his seat as he answered mrs cairns said you could tell me about anne so i can what do you want to know mr ware who is she who was her father is he dead or alive what do you know about the scarlet cross and he stopped for the princess had opened her eyes to their fullest extent the scarlet cross you know about that also she asked of course i do there was an anonymous letter i have seen the letter or at least a copy indeed said ware much astonished and an enamelled cross i have seen the cross also it appears to me princess that you know everything about the case she glanced again at the clock and smiled as she replied i am a friend of anne's mr ware i dare say you would like to know who told me all these things well you shall be enlightened at ten o'clock meantime i can tell you all i do know about anne and her father you will speak freely he asked mistrustfully absolutely you you she hesitated you love anne she gave him a searching look yes i see you do i can speak openly will you have another cup of coffee no another cigarette 
ah there is the box a match now now said giles eagerly what about anne what about myself first of all mr ware i am a hungarian i quarrelled with my people and ran away finding myself stranded in london with very little money i tried to get a post as a governess i went to mrs cairns and thus became acquainted with anne we became great friends she told me everything about herself when i knew her history we became greater friends than ever i was a governess only for a year then some one heard me sing and she shrugged her beautiful shoulders but that is quite another story mr ware i am a concert singer now and it pays me excellently i am very pleased with your success princess but anne she flashed a rather annoyed look at him you are scarcely so chivalrous as i thought mr ware she said coldly no say nothing i quite understand let us talk of anne i will tell you her history she relighted her cigarette which had gone out and continued her father was a gambler and a wanderer he lived mostly on the continent monte carlo for choice anne's mother here the princess paused and then went on with an obvious effort i know nothing of anne's mother mr ware she died when anne was a child mr denham brought up his daughter in a haphazard way was his name really denham so anne told me i had no reason to think that it was otherwise he was a gentleman of good family but an outcast from his people for reason of his reckless folly i also am an outcast said she pleasantly but merely because i am strong-minded i am not foolish no princess said giles looking keenly at her i should certainly not call you foolish but i can be foolish on occasions said she quickly and flushed as she glanced at him like all women but anne i see we must get back to anne well she having better moral principles than her father grew wearied of their wandering life she decided to become a governess mr denham put her to school at hampstead a sister of mrs cairns keeps the school and that is why anne is so intimate with mrs cairns and when her education was finished she took a situation in italy there she remained some years afterwards she rejoined her father for a time he died at florence typhoid fever i believe and anne found herself alone she returned to england and assisted by mrs cairns took various situations she always returned to mrs cairns when out of an engagement it was on one of these occasions that i met her we have been friends for a long time mr ware then anne was engaged by mrs morley and and the rest you know there is no more to be said is that all said giles disappointed by this bald narrative the princess shrugged her shoulders and throwing aside her cigarette leaned back with her hands behind her head what would you mr ware anne is a good woman good women never have any history can you tell me anything about this guarded cross anne never spoke of such a thing to me but my friend may be able to tell you ah the princess raised her head as a ring came to the door there is my friend before his time too but we have finished our conversation mr ware for the present yes she looked at him suddenly but certainly she said in her vivacious way you must come and see me again we will have much to talk of you love music i will sing to you and here she broke off to greet a newcomer much to the relief of giles who was beginning to feel uncomfortable how do you do mr steele with an exclamation ware rose it was indeed steele who stood before him looking as round and rosy and cheerful as ever you are surprised to see me sir he said with a twinkle i am very much surprised i went to see you yesterday and found that i was out of town so i was so i am supposed to be but the telegram of the princess here told me that she expected you this evening so i left my country business and came up you see said the princess sitting down again amongst her cushions you see mr ware i told you we had a mutual friend 
now you know how i am so well acquainted with the case and she laughed the princess explained steele seeing giles astonishment read all about the case being a friend of miss denham's and seeing that i had charge of the matter she sent for me we have talked over the case and i have received much assistance from miss i mean from this very clever lady the princess caraxay and steele bowed but stammered ware still puzzled you believe miss denham to be guilty surely the princess will not no no came from the divan in the deep-toned voice of the woman anne is my friend i would not help him to arrest her the fact is said steele easily i have changed my opinion mr ware and i think miss denham is innocent the man who killed miss kent is called wilson wilson and who is wilson and why did he kill her i don't know who wilson is replied steele i am trying to find out i am not quite certain why he killed her but i am beginning to suspect that it was on account of this inherited money i told you that princess he added turning to the divan yes mr steele and i said then i say now i do not agree if you would be more explicit said ware feeling helpless steele took no notice of him for the moment then if it's not the money i don't know what the motive can be he turned to ware see here sir this wilson whomsoever he may be lived with the mother of asher's office boy he was her lodger the boy told him about the money coming to miss kent afterwards the lad had a summons given him to serve on morley wilson offered to take it and did so he removed his effects from mrs benker's house she's the mother of the lad and went down to rickwell you know what happened there now if he didn't kill miss kent on account of the money why did he ask the office boy about the matter giles shook his head i can't say he said no more than i can explain why miss denham helped him to escape well steele scratched his chin i have an idea about that but you must not be offended if i speak plainly mr ware i shall be offended if you speak evil of my friend miss denham this was from the princess who raised herself up with her eyes flashing angrily i will not have it she said then am i to say nothing asked steele ironically nothing against miss denham put in giles you are both rather difficult to deal with remarked steele with a shrug however i'll explain and you can draw your own inferences it seems from what mrs benker said that mr wilson was mostly out all night and in all day also he was frequently absent for a long time he likewise took much interest in society newspapers and in the movements of the aristocracy he also wore on his chain an ornament a red enameled cross in fact what cried giles with a start and he noted that the princess startled likewise and that her face grew pale he wore a red enameled cross repeated steele imperturbably on his watch-chain mrs benker had been in the service of the late lady summersdale when the diamonds of that lady were stolen she remembered that a red enameled cross had been found in the safe whence the jewels were taken wilson was amused at this he said that the cross was the emblem of a charitable society from which he received a weekly sum well he hesitated and looked at his listeners that clue came to an end i lost sight of wilson i then went to look for the red cross the yacht i mean what has the yacht to do with wilson asked ware angrily if you remember sir i told you that wilson was the man who served the summons on mr morley and who as i believed killed miss kent he afterwards fled with miss denham and went on board the yacht is not that the case sir so far as i can judge it is muttered giles reluctantly well then went on steele triumphantly while the princess as giles observed listened intently i looked after that yacht i could not find her but i am looking for her now that is why i am in the country i came up this morning from deal and i go back there to-morrow i find sir that this yacht puts in at various places every now and then most yachts do yes sir 
but while most yachts are at anchor in a place does a burglary invariably occur no sir wait for giles had sprung to his feet lady summersdale's place was on the seashore her diamonds were stolen at the time this yacht was at anchor in the bay a red cross was found in the safe the boat is called by that name several times i find that when the yacht has been at a certain place a burglary has occurred this man wilson wears a red cross on his watch-chain now sir i believe that he is one of a gang of burglars that the cross is a sign this explains his interest in the society papers he wants to find out where the best swag is to be found and but what has all this to do with my friend anne cried the princess steele shrugged his shoulders i say nothing he replied you can draw your own inferences do you mean to say that miss denham i say nothing interrupted steele catching up his hat mr ware i am at your service when you want me princess he bowed and went out as the outer door closed giles and his hostess looked at one another the man's a foul liar burst out giles furiously yes the woman was very pale still my friend anne once told me told you what what i will tell you if you come again she said under her breath and suddenly left the room she did not return end of chapter eleven read by celine major chapter twelve of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh chapter twelve mrs perry's tea six months had passed away since the death of daisy the grass was now green above her grave where she had fallen there had she been buried beside her father and the villagers often talked of the tragedy and pointed out to strangers the spot where it had taken place but she who had killed the girl they still considered anne guilty had never been brought to justice from the day she had fled on ware's motor-car nothing had been heard of her no one troubled about the dead girl daisy had not been very popular during her life and now that she was gone her name was scarcely mentioned for a time mrs morley had placed flowers on the green mound but after her return from brighton had desisted the grass grew long and the path beside the grave green a tombstone of white marble had been erected by giles and already that was becoming discoloured daisy and her resting-place were forgotten the poor child might have been dead a hundred years instead of six months only the tale of her death remained as a fireside legend to be amplified and improved upon as the years went by after that one sensation life went on in rickwell very much as it had always done morley and his wife returned to the elms and instead of having a new governess the triplets went to school mrs morley never spoke of anne or daisy and seemed to grow no more cheerful than before even in the perfect summer weather she still looked pale and subdued and her eyes still had in their watery depths an anxious expression every one said that she was regretting the death of daisy and the wickedness of anne but others remarked that she had looked just as haggard and worn before as after the tragedy mrs perry gave it as her opinion that the poor lady had a secret sorrow and tried by skilful questioning to learn what it was but either mrs perry was not clever enough or mrs morley had no secret to reveal for the scandal-monger learned nothing the only thing that mrs morley said was that she missed her girls whereupon mrs perry told her that she ought to be ashamed of herself seeing that the three were getting a good education however this did not seem to console mrs morley much for she wept copiously in her usual fashion the good old lady returned to her cottage very much disgusted it was rather a dull time for her as she had heard no news for a long time every one was so well behaved that there was no scandal going and mrs perry began to think that she ought to pay a visit to town her cousin mrs McHale, had already gone back to new zealand with a fearful opinion of english society for mrs perry had blackened the country just as though she had been a probor 
then one day her little maid who was called jane and had the sharpest ears of any one in the village brought in breakfast with the remark that mr ware had returned mrs perry sat up in bed where she always partook of the first meal of the day and looked excited when did he arrive jane how does he look what does he say jane being experienced answered these questions categorically he came last night mom with trim and looks a shadder of hisself but said as he was glad to be home again and what was the news oh said mrs perry rubbing her nose with a teaspoon wants to hear the news does he i'll ask him to tea to-morrow no to-day you can take a note up to his place jane yes mom replied jane who was friendly with giles housekeeper and don't let me hear that you've been gossiping with the servants jane snapped mrs perry who was unusually cross in the morning and looked an ogress without her wig i hate gossip you have two ears and one mouth jane that means you should listen twice as much as you speak yes mom replied jane who had long since taken the measure of her mistress's foot then she went to the door and was recalled to be told that the cook was to make a cake she was going again and had to return for instructions about some particular tea then there was the silver to be especially polished and various other matters to be gone into until jane said was whirling and her feet ached she went down to the kitchen and told the cook that the old vinegar bottle was more fractious than usual if only mrs perry had heard her but she thought jane was afraid of her whereas jane was meek to her face and saucy behind her back the old lady heard all the gossip in the neighbourhood but she never knew the remarks that were made in her own kitchen however it thus came about that giles received a civil note from mrs perry asking him to come to afternoon tea his first thought was to refuse but he then reflected that if he wanted to learn all that had taken place during his absence mrs perry was the very person who could tell him he knew she was an old cat and had a dangerous tongue still she was much better than a newspaper being as her enemies said more spicy he therefore accepted the invitation and appeared in the little parlour about five he had been for a ride and having put his horse up at the inn asked the old lady to excuse his dress mrs perry did so with pleasure giles was a splendid figure of a man and looked a picture in his trim riding dress the old dame had an eye for a fine man and cast an approving glance at his shapely legs and slim figure but she frowned when her eyes rose to his face it was thinner than she liked to see there was not the old brave light in his eyes and his fair moustache had lost the jaunty curl which to her romantic mind had made him such a gallant lover giles was one of the few persons mrs perry did not abuse for his good looks and many courtesies had long since won her foolish old heart although she would never confess to it but then mrs perry was softer than she looked who had been taking the heart out of you ware she asked in her gentlemanly way which giles knew and had often laughed at no one he answered gloomily unless you call fate some one i call anne denham some one she replied coolly so you haven't found her yet poor soul no i have looked everywhere she has vanished like a bubble it is just as well you couldn't possibly marry her and bring her back to rickwell as your wife why not she is innocent you said yourself that she was and i believe it i have stood up for her all through all the same where there would be a scandal if she came back as mrs ware i don't care two straws for that said giles flinging back his head no she replied dryly i know that you're an obstinate man as any one can see with half an eye well i'm glad to see you again sit down in the armchair yonder and tell me what you have been doing all these months no good if your face is the index of your mind ware laughed and sitting down managed to stow his long legs out of the way no easy matter in the little room then he accepted a cup of excellent tea from mrs perry and some of her celebrated cake he did not reply immediately as he did not want to tell her the truth 
she had too long a tongue to be told anything which it was necessary to keep secret he put her off as best he could with a general answer i have just been going to and fro like satan sniffed mrs parry he's your model is he so you have been searching for anne where in paris and in london but i can't find her she doesn't want you to find her replied the old lady if she did you would stand face to face with her soon enough that goes without speaking retorted ware however my adventures would not amuse you mrs parry suppose you tell me what has been going on in these parts as if i knew anything of what was going on said mrs parry giles laughed it was a fiction with mrs parry that she never interfered with other people's business whereas there was not a pie within miles into which she had not thrust her finger but he knew how to start her tongue the morleys what about them no change ware the tricolour has gone to school i mean the three children although i can't get out of the habit of calling them by that ridiculous name mrs morley is as dismal as ever and seems to miss anne very much as well she might anne was a good friend to her and morley he has found a new friend said mrs parry triumphantly a man called franklin george franklin cried ware startled for he had heard all about the fortune from Steele. he is the man who inherited the five thousand a year that powell left to daisy Steele, the detective told me and now i think of it morley told me himself when i was ill it's the same man ware he has been here two months and has taken the priory that's a cheerful place said giles why it has been standing empty for three years i know the last tenants left because they said it was haunted rubbish and by what by a white lady she wanders up and down the park wringing her hands but this franklin evidently does not believe in ghosts for he has been there these two months and never a word from him what kind of a man is he a tall man with very black eyes and a black beard no added mrs parry correcting herself i am wrong he had a beard when he first came and now has shaved it off have you seen much of him hardly anything morley is the only person with whom he is intimate in any degree he hardly ever comes out and when people call he is not at home why the man should have five thousand a year i can't make out he does no good with it any family a wife there is a daughter i understand but she is an invalid and keeps to her room or to the grounds weak in the head i should say seeing how secluded her father keeps her have you seen her yes i came on her unexpectedly one day or rather one evening a short girl with red hair and a freckled face she looks a fool and was dressed in all the colours of the rainbow i don't wonder he i mean franklin keeps her out of sight humph said ware rather astonished by the extent of mrs parry's information did the servants tell you all this there are no servants retorted mrs parry with scorn the man is a mean creature you may not believe me ware but he has only three people to do the work of that huge house then there are three servants some people might call them so retorted mrs parry determined not to give up her point but they are a queer lot not at all like the domestic i have been used to an old man who acts as a kind of butler a woman his wife who is the cook and a brat of fifteen the daughter i expect who does the general work oh it's quite a family affair a queer household does this man intend to stop long he has taken the priory on a seven years lease and morley visits him yes and he visits morley they are as thick as thieves perhaps they may be thieves for all i know does this man franklin go about much not a great deal but he occasionally takes a walk into the village sometimes he comes to church and i believe the rector has called 
i wish any one but him had taken the priory we want company in this dull place will you call and see him i ought to replied ware slowly seeing that i was engaged to daisy who should have had the money but from what you say i should not think franklin would care to see me and certainly he does not seem to be a desirable neighbour he's quite a mistake snorted mrs perry i tried to be friendly but he gave me to understand that he preferred his books to my company he's a great reader i understand evidently the good lady was somewhat sore on the subject for she shortly changed it for another first she began to talk of daisy secondly wonder who had killed her and why and thirdly she made mention of the grave there's something queer about that she remarked rubbing her nose a sure sign of perplexity how do you mean queer well mrs perry looked thoughtfully at her guest then before replying she gave him permission to smoke i like the scent of a cigar about the place she said it reminds me of the colonel he was an awful man to smoke the one habit i could not break him of giles lighted a cigarette willingly enough and repeated his question this time he got an answer that surprised him it's this way said the old lady taking up her knitting for some time the grave was quite neglected no i gave orders that it should be looked after i told drake and my gardener he's a friend of the sexton's and i thought there would be no trouble there has been then said mrs parry triumphantly the sexton and your gardener quarrelled and have not been on speaking terms for months thomas the sexton won't let williams do anything to the grave and out of spite won't touch it himself so it went to rack and ruin the grass is long or rather was long and the flowers all gone to seed a sore wreck where i am most annoyed i'll see about it to-morrow there is no need the grave is now as neat as a new pin the grass is clipped and fresh flowers were planted a month ago i never saw a grave better kept quite a labour of love and who has done this mrs morley pish said the old dame pettishly as though that woman had the gumption to do anything hum no one knows who has done it what do you mean ware looked puzzled what i say i usually do the grave has been put to rights at first few people noticed it because few go into that corner but one day some imp of a choir boy saw the improvement and told old thomas he came and looked at it and others came no one knew who had put it to rights then continued mrs perry impressively it was discovered that it was done at night at night yes but no one seems to know by whom or at what time every morning some fresh improvement was noted some people watched but saw no one coming yet when the watching was dropped there was something fresh done it may be a brownie added mrs perry with a sniff but it's a mystery even i can't find out the truth it's very strange said ware thoughtfully it's worse it's improper cried mrs perry in her sternest voice i see no reason why such a thing should be done in the darkness of night though to be sure she continued rubbing her nose we have had moonlight lately i must see into this said ware rising you'll find nothing every one has watched but to no purpose my friend now the idiots talk of ghosts and what not what do you think yourself asked giles why that some one who loved daisy better than you did has taken pity on her neglected grave and don't he cried wincing i did my best to make her happy the engagement was unfortunate the marriage would have been still more so it is just as well the poor girl died no no i don't blame you but anne don't say a word against anne he interrupted quickly 
then before his hostess could reply he took his leave i must be going now mrs perry was not at all pleased but knowing how far she could go decided that she had reached the limit of his forbearance with feminine craft she smothered her resentment and parted from him in the most cordial manner all the same she still held to her opinion that anne was not the wife for her favorite giles went at once to the churchyard to view daisy's grave he found everything in good order the grass was shorn the flowers were blooming and the white marble of the stone had been cleansed carefully wondering who had performed this labor of love he returned to get his horse at the gate of the churchyard a tall man passed him with bent head as he brushed past the young squire he raised it suddenly giles saw a clean-shaven face large black eyes and a sallow complexion he stood aside to let him pass rather a nice day said ware pleasantly very responded the man and continued his walk giles knew very well that he was the new tenant of the priory it was in his mind to speak to him but on second thoughts he decided to do so on a more propitious occasion standing at the gate he looked thoughtfully after the retiring figure there was something familiar about it and about the face of the man his eyes especially aroused a vague recollection in his mind but he could not as the saying goes put a name to it but while walking to the inn it suddenly flashed into his brain that this was the man whom he had seen in church on that fatal new year's eve it's the clerk he said breathlessly he has shaved his beard he is wilson the man who fled with anne who murdered poor daisy End of chapter twelve read by Celine Major.